All the pretty girls stand up. All the pretty boys stand Sweet. up. Pretty boys in the Sweet. building. Sweet. This right here is my sway. Sway. All the girls are on me. Damn. Everybody pay attention. This right here is my pretty boy sway. Get out the way, pretty boy coming through. I messed up. I meant to be on camera when the logo went away and I screwed it all up. But it's okay. The show must go on as we only just got started. Happy Sunday to all you guys. Hope you're doing well out there. Thanks for joining me on the stream today. We got a fun show in store. X-Men 97. That's all that anybody wants to talk about right now. That is the greatest show in the history of shows to ever show. At least that's the conversation. That's how it feels. Because based on that last episode, man, was that good. That was amazing. That was absolutely some of the best MCU content I think that we've got in the last four years. Is that safe to say? Is that an overstatement? I, I mean, I don't think so, right? I mean, that was pretty legit. So in this stream, you know, we wanted to, uh, I, I thought I would fire up the camera. I mean, there's a few things. Obviously I got my Kickstarter, you know, there's a few days left. So I got to do a little bit of that. I got to talk about it, you know, maybe get some people on board. You know, we're so close to 200 backers, you know, it'd be kind of cool to hit that number, um, especially by the end of the stream. But also I just kind of wanted to, you know, do a show hang out with everybody here today, talk about X-Men 97 and take a look at the market, you know, because what, what I think is so cool about the show, especially being an animation, is that it's actually got a lot of stuff moving and it's not necessarily like full FOMO, like people going crazy and paying outrageous prices for stuff, you know, not like Earth X-12, but it's got people buying books and it's got people speculating again and I say the word speculate, but I mean that in sort of like a good way. Like this is like the fun kind of speculation where people are actually kind of excited of like, oh, well, where could it go? You know, what book could get hot, you know, or what what book should I keep an eye out for? You know, and and so in this stream, we're going to talk about it because I got I got some books that I, that I pulled up. And then there's some other MCU news that I think would be kind of cool to, you know, dive into. Uh, we had CinemaCon, which if you guys don't know, CinemaCon is like the big trade show for like movie theaters and there was a lot of uh kind of news that came out of that so i don't know just a kind of a bunch of stuff to talk about it's sunday what else are we gonna do guys what else are we gonna do you know on a sunday um but let's check in with the chat here see what's up to everybody thanks again for hanging out guys uh we got jay mortify remember it man that was so good i didn't even remember the line until he said it. And then when he said it, it was like, oh yeah, you know, like just riding a bike. And that's really one of the things that we'll get into it when we talk about the show, because that's one of the other things that I think is so good about it that I'm so impressed by is the attention to detail, you know, and all the call callbacks and, and everything that's in there. Like clearly they did their homework, which I think is, you know, one of the big steps, um, that, you know, requires them to do a successful show. And I think people really appreciate that. So we will remember it for quite a while. That's for sure. We got Brandon here in the chat. Cyclops Heart. Hi, Swagglehoss. Full release on that intro song by any chance. Full release on that intro song? You mean my intro song? Like the, the one that I play before the stream? If you're talking about that, then uh, it's already out. It's Pretty Boy Swag. It's a, a remix of Pretty Boy Swag. It's a music video that I actually directed for Soldier Boy. Uh, but I played the remix one so I don't get stricken by my former client. 
Uh, Metal Bum in the house. Too bad it's just five episodes. Love X Men. Isn't it more than five? Isn't it going to eight? You know, are we going to see uh, more episodes coming out? I think we are. Uh, Metal Bum with the swaggy. We got GT Key comic in the house. GT Key. Good to see you, man. Thanks for always stopping by. We got Derek Neiman in the house. What's going on, Derek? Good to see you. Really appreciate you always uh, hanging out. We got Euler Workshops. Oh, man, there's the other one. I can't feel you. It's got a cartoon. It's making adult men cry. I mean, that's impressive, right? That's like that's like the hardest audience right there. Pretty Boy Swag. Remember it. Uh, where's the Sanity Trailer? Well, you know, Eggplant, you know, I have the Sanity Trailer, but I didn't always want to have to open up the stream with it, you know? I mean, well, I, sh I probably should have. I probably should have. I mean, we're going to talk about Sanity in a second, but I'll probably end the stream with it. There's two more days to go. We're going to do more trailer forcing of you guys. Uh, RMS Collects, what's going on, man? Just continue to say hi to everybody here. Uh, DJ Moonchild in the house, what's going on, man? Um a plan here. Hot take. Gambit isn't really dead. Is anyone really dead? No, no. In fact, we're actually going to talk about Robert Downey Jr. That's another piece of news that came out this past week. Something that he said. And Iron Man isn't dead. You know, no one is actually dead. I mean, we saw Cable. You guys know what it is. The cable is, was in the episode. So, uh, you know. So hold on. Oh. Amazing Murphinator, you know what? I'm sorry, I apologize. I probably should have given this, this uh, up front here. We're gonna get into spoilers, okay? We're gonna get into spoilers. So there might be spoilers in the chat. There might be spoilers on uh, my end. So if you haven't seen the last episode of X-Men 97 especially, that one has major spoilers in it. So this may be something that, you know, if you don't care about spoilers, you can hang out, we're gonna talk about it. If you do care about spoilers, just know it might happen. You know, we're going to talk about all the episodes. I'm assuming that because it's Sunday, show came out or episode came out on Wednesday, we can we can have a conversation and and you guys will be okay with it. Uh, it's great to have the X-Men back and enjoying them again, like a thirsty man in the desert, refreshing. You know, hey, it's like nostalgia popular characters. You know, they're just always so good. They always so good. Uh, Prime One Collector in the house here. Uh, it sounds like you need to get that checked out, man. That doesn't sound good. So it is 10, 10 episodes. Neil, what's going on, man? Good to see you. Thanks for stopping by. We got Comic Doctor in the house. If you guys don't know, check out Comic Doctor's YouTube channel as well. Great dude. Amazing presser. I was on his channel a couple weeks ago, and um, I think he's got uh, a show coming up this week to talk about X-Men 97 as well. At least I saw his uh, uh, thumbnail promoting it. Uh, all right. Spoiler. All right, we're we're not going to get that in. We're not going to get into that yet. All right, all right, all right, guys. Well, that's it for the saying what's up to everyone in the chat. If you guys could hit the like button, I would appreciate that. A um, couple other little things before we really get into you know the episode and some of the market stuff, which I think is really interesting, is uh, you know we had to talk about sanity, sanity, my comic series issues one through three, the Kickstarter. Only three days left, guys. Three days left on my Lovecraftian comic book adventure. If you guys are fans of cosmic horror, you guys are fans of, you know, noir detective stories, this was sort of my foray into that space. Um, I'm, I'm personally a big fan of the genre. Uh, you know, this is kind of the roots of comic book storytelling, you know, the old school detective comic uh, mixed in with, you know, the Lovecraft vibes. Uh, but yeah, head on over to, uh, you know, my Kickstarter if you're interested in supporting. Uh, this is a project that I've worked super hard on. Um, very passionate about the material. Uh, there's a lot of great tiers here, variant covers, you know, we got ones by Ivan Tao. We got some Jenna Cha ones here. Uh, we got some EC ones, if you like the golden age style, you know, so there's all different kinds of stuff. And so this is a, a series I've been working hard on. I, you know, you, you guys have probably heard me talk about it many times. Um, but yeah, it, this is, um, three days left on the campaign. Um, obviously we already hit our goal, which is, which is amazing. And actually, uh, as I look at it, you know, we just hit that $22,000 mark, which unlocks the first stretch goal right here. We're doing trading cards, guys. We're officially doing trading cards. I'm already working on some of the trading card design stuff and I got some good ideas in there. So, you know, who doesn't love trading cards? 
you know, we're going to, we're going to get some, we're going to get them in there with, with your orders. So we got all the different tiers here, you know, uh, definitely go check, check them out. Uh, there's different cool things like, um, you know, of course you can order the comic books. Of course you can order, um, you know, some prints and some extra stuff. You can be in the book, you know, shout out page is kind of cool. Um, and I also have a bunch of original art to share with you guys, which, uh, you know, I had uh, Jarrell Threat here, amazing Magic the Gathering artist. He commissioned, uh, I had him, I commissioned him to do this key art piece, which is the one you see everywhere. Um, and he has kind of his preliminary sketch. This one actually already sold. Um, and actually, like, he just sent me the stuff. And if you guys will at least indulge with me, he sent me his, uh, his work here. I just got it in the mail not too long ago. So this was his pr preliminary sketch, which I thought was pretty cool, like the original art piece for that. And then check this out, guys. I got the actual oil painting, which this is really cool. This is something I, I do have it on the Kickstarter, but it's, it's something that if it doesn't sell, I kind of won't mind keeping it. I mean, look at how cool this is, you know, on the canvas right there. This is the original work, the original painting. Um, he had it, you know, he, he, he had commissioned the work. Um, it, we have prints, you know, in, in a lot of the orders and stuff, but uh, I had, a, I commissioned the work from him and, and it took a while actually for it to dry. So uh, I only just got it uh, a couple of days ago. So I thought it'd be kind of fun to share it, you know, on camera with you guys. I mean, I think this stuff is cool. This is very exciting for me. You know, maybe you guys are not interested, but if you are, you can go over here, support. We have original art pages for sale. I have them right here. Some more stuff. This is by uh, Santiago Espina. You know, he, he's got uh, his original interior art pages. You know, he, he was uh, kind enough to let me purchase them uh, from him. And we have them for sale, including some of the covers right here. This is the original art cover. Look at that. You can see the whiteout on it. Uh, this one already sold though, so no longer up for sale, but there's definitely things that you can get if you guys are into uh, original art collecting. You know, I think that that's always kind of a fun thing to add um, just for other people um, who may want something a little more special than the comic book. And of course, like I said, I already, I have the oil painting for sale, which I, which I just showed you guys, but uh, you know, I don't know if it's in everyone's budget range and should it sell or should it not sell? I won't mind framing it and keeping it for myself. You know, I'm going to put it up somewhere in the back wall. You know, I'm definitely going to get it nicely framed, put it up next to Sean's cover art back there. Maybe I can put it, not, I, I'm kind of running out of real estate, to be honest. Maybe I should get rid of one of my shelves. I might do that. We'll see what happens, but I got the original painting here. So I'm excited uh, to have it and um, we'll see. We'll see if anyone ends up picking it up, but that's it right now. That's my Kickstarter, guys. Link is in the description if you want to, you know, pledge. Again, a Lovecraftian comic book noir story. Um, I wrote it myself, if that wasn't clear. Created the world with Santiago and an amazing team, um, Maxim Strelkov on colors and Davidson Mains doing the letters. Incredible variant cover artists. And um, this is a project I'm super passionate about. I want to go all the way with, you know. Maybe one day I can have an animated series on Disney Plus that makes everyone cry. That would be pretty cool. All right, let's get into it, guys. Let's get into some spoilers. I mean, you already know what you're looking at right here with this image. We have the Death of Superman pose. Do you guys think that this was an homage to Death of Superman? I'm not sure. Like, but when this, when I saw this, this was like, oh, a, a clear striking resemblance to, uh, you know, th that particular moment. But it, it was uh, really an amazing last episode. The whole series has been amazing, in my opinion. And like I already kind of mentioned, I, I think one of the most incredible parts about the show is how they've been able to keep it familiar, yet also keep it fresh, which is a really difficult needle to thread. And I think they've done an amazing job doing that. Um, and it, it's it's kind of a, a it's kind of truly remarkable, like how much the show doesn't dumb anything down, and it it knows that the audience knows the characters. And I think that that's been something that um, I don't know if that that would be a, a thing that they would have had to fight 
with producers, you know, someone who like works in film and works in entertainment, I can imagine a lot of the conversations, you know, in, in, in the pitching process being like, oh, you know, we have to make sure that, that new people uh, can be introed into these characters in, in a way that makes them understand like the dynamics and the relationships and stuff. And while they have done that, I feel like for the most part, we kind of just hit the ground running. And I think that that's why we've gotten such amazing payoffs with this particular moment, for instance, because this is not just like five episodes and then you get this emotional beat. This is like decades and decades of building upon characters we know that we're familiar with. And then also on top of that, building off of a cartoon that we're also familiar with. And then on top of that, all of the comic series that we're also familiar with. So that's why the, I think it, it has such a significant punch um, when these particular moments hit and the lines pay off and all that. And so even though like the show itself has done a great job building it up, it's like, it feels like we're watching, you know, decades of, of animation stuff. And on top of that, did you guys see this little Easter egg here? Like I couldn't believe, like I didn't see it when it happened, but I couldn't believe that this was in the show and it got me pretty excited starts to renew some of my faith. So before the moment that uh, Genosha gets invaded, there's actually a, a shot. I, I think this is like the camera's panned up and then it tilts down to probably like when Cable enters, but it actually has the watcher right here. DJ Moonchild, you said that you saw it? Man, I did not see it. I totally did not see it. Okay, yeah, Comic Doctor, you saw it? So. I saw this after the fact in one of those like, oh, hey, here's the Easter eggs you missed. And to me, that is amazing that they included him here because obviously they're trying to imply, okay, this is a really big moment. And I kind of went into this article and one of the producers said this, and I, I'm, I'm going somewhere with this all guys. So, you know, give, give me, let me cook for a second. Okay. Uh, he, the, one of the producers said, we have, a, we have a great executive who works with us named Drew River who manages the continuity of the timeline. And obviously that becomes more complex as you enter the multiverse saga, tracking multiple timelines. Uh, Winderbaum explained, uh, I should clarify, this is an article talking about the Watcher cameo, Winderbaum, one of the producers on X-Men 97. And they're talking about this internal person, Drew River, who kind of oversees all of the continuity and timeline stuff. And I thought it was interesting because even though it, it, the article says that, oh, he got hired around Loki season one time, it feels like they're trying to finally write some of the frustrations that have been in the MCU where nothing feels connected at all. And the fact that they included the Watcher in this series and that they're kind of implying that this overseer timeline continuity person is helping all these projects talk and relate to each other. Like that to me is a finally a step in the right direction of like, okay, hey, we, we realized that we just threw a bunch of, you know, spaghetti to the wall and just to see what stick or stuck and not a lot of stuff stuck. So we have to start, start to try to tie all these projects together. And it feels like they're doing that. And it almost feels like what we're seeing in X-Men 97 could have implications into what may happen in say a Deadpool Wolverine. There's speculation right now about Cassandra Nova and how that could tie in. Um, there's other connected tissue uh, where this could all be going. There's some people saying, okay, we might see what if crossover into X-Men 97. They're already building out uh, X-Men 97 season two. And so I say all that to say this, I think the comic market are finally starting to have faith once again in like, hey, the thing that I see on screen, I actually kind of want to own. I actually kind of want to pick up the book. So I kind of have a bunch of uh, books and and some key collector stuff that uh, uh, things that have gotten hot. And I'm curious what you guys think about this. I kind of wanted to talk about you know some of the keys that have been moving. And let's start with this one here. This is the trending twenty list, which if you guys know the key collector twenty twenty just came out the other day. And one of the ones on it, which I feel like is the first thing we have to talk about, even though it didn't relate to the last episode, was Uncanny X Men two twenty seven. Now, if you guys know what this is, this is the first full appearance of the character Adversary. Adversary was this crow, scarecrow looking thing. Now, admittedly, I'm not an adversary historian. I don't know if there's any adversary historians in the chat, 
over there. But uh, I guess they kind of reworked his character design. He's kind of looking like this Black Crow Raven thing. And there's already been talk that, you know, this character is going to have more involvement. And so all of a sudden this book got, got hot. And it's not like we're talking crazy prices, you know, but just the fact that you have volume, I think, says something. You know, just the fact that that this is a book that, you know, you can go to any LCS and you can find this book, you know, Fall of the Mutant. I feel like this run is is everywhere. This, this, usually, you know what it is? Every time you dig into X-Men, you're always hoping that when you go into that bin, you're going to find some like, oh, give me some John Byrne, you know, give me some, uh, you know, 94 through 130. Like, that's what you're always hoping. But it never works out that way. Every time you go into the bin, you already get pushed to 200, you know, 10, 220. So you always start with the fall of the mutants. That's where, you know, every bin starts. And then, of course, it never has like Mr. Sinister and it. it never has X-Men 266. Either way, this book has been moving a lot and you can you can really see it. I mean, the episode aired two weeks ago, right? So if you go down here, I think it was April 6th. And so if you just do a quick like eBay glance, you look at March and it's like, okay, yeah, one here on the 24th, one on the 26th, one on the 28th, here's a lot, one on the 31st, one on the 3rd, and then it gets to April 6th, the episode airs, and then you have 7, 7, April 7, April 7, April 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 11, 11, 11, 12, 12, 12, you know, so this is where, how you can tell that all of a sudden people are interested in the show, interested in where it's going to go interested in the material. And I think that that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool overall. All right, let's see what's else, what else was in here. You have the first cameo one. We're going to talk about cameos in a second, guys. Don't, don't, I mean, buy these books if you want to buy them, but like you might as well get the full appearance, right? You might as well get the full. Comic Doctor says, submissions are sizzling. Collectors are getting excited once again. Oh, I guess you would know. You would, you would be a good kind of uh, um, room temperature check in that instance, you know, you guys, again, comic doctor, he does a lot of submissions to CGC presses a lot of books. So he has a lot of people he does submissions for. So he's always going to see, you know, um, how much of that, like, or, you know, what, what's being sent, you know, sort of a sniff check or, or gut check. Derek says, can you imagine your job being full-time managing continuity of timelines? I mean, it's an important job and actually little sidebar. I find it surprising that that wasn't always the case, you know, and, and maybe this is a uh, sort of a telling that maybe there was a point where Kevin Feige could just sort of do it all. Like he could just kind of in his head, remember all the projects that he has going on and he can kind of remember all the connective tissues and stuff. And then at a certain point, it's like, dude, you, you don't have enough bandwidth to think about all this stuff. Um, and the reason I think it's surprising is, you know, I've worked at large video game companies like Riot Games and Wizard, and I've been in their R&D departments and, and creative, you know, world building stuff. And there are always historians working, like even in those places. And you can't have the level of depth and connection uh, to like the world and the games and the transmedia narrative. That's a big thing. Transmedia narrative is, is in everything now. You can't have that uh, connection unless you have these people that work in the building whose sole job it is to keep everything organized and to make sure that the rules are being followed. And this is my little, not, not a rant, but you know, there's the, a lot of writers get flack or there's been, you know, a lot of screenwriters that get flack for like, Oh, you know, uh, Taika Waititi did, didn't read the comic books. And he's like, Oh, I don't care to read the comic books and all that sort of thing. I'm not forgiving that, but I'm willing to, give them some benefit of the doubt that like, I don't think you have to be a historian to write the screenplay so long as you have people in the building who you can reference as the historian. Now you have to respect it as a writer. You have to like know that, Hey, you're, you're getting handed this baton. You really have a, a big duty to carry it to the next, you know, across the finish line. Um, but you don't have to get, again, don't have to be a historian as long as there's people in the building that are that. And it feels like, did they never have this? Like, is this is this a revolutionary idea for them to, to start doing it? Um, but either way, I'm glad that they finally are doing it. You know, I'm glad that they're actually doing it. Um, so again, trending 20 lists, more X-Men books. And again, this is what's so crazy. 
Marvel Comics Presents 72, uh, Uncanny X-Men 300. This was like the legacy virus thing, which I don't know if I'm getting this right. The legacy virus is the thing that Cable had, right, in his DNA. Uh, you have First Appearance of Forge, a classic book right here. You know, how, how many times during COVID were people specking on Forge? How many times did this book show up on hot lists? I feel like this is the perfect book to constantly show up on hot lists. And then finally you get them. You know, you get some version of him and it's actually good. And then of course, you know, we have all the Madeline Pryor stuff, which last week we had the trending list was, rid was riddled with Madeline Pryor books and it just continues. So again, Cassandra Nova, people thinking that this is going to lead to, you know, uh, Deadpool and Wolverine, that, that there could be some connection here. And then you have first appearance of Morph, X-Men Adventures number one. And I got to say, I mean... You know, this book is kind of a nothing burger book, but I feel like with this show and how much people are gravitating to Morph, like it makes you wonder, like is Morph, because this book was connected to the TV show and never in 616 continuity. And I asked this question, I don't know if you guys know, is Morph, what is Morph doing right now? Is anyone reading X-Men right now? Is he in 616 continuity? If he isn't, I feel like they're probably going to put him in 616 continuity, right? Because he's he's just going to become such an important character to, to the to the entire uh X universe, you know, reinforced by the show that's going on. We got Comic Ozzy in the house. What's going on, Comic Ozzy? Good to see you. Hey, sidebar. I don't know if there's anyone going to C2E2 in the chat, but I'm going. This is my first public announcement. I'm going to C2E2. I will be in Chicago. I'm just going to go to hang out. Um, and Comic Ozzy is also going, even though he's not technically going. But now I'm going to publicly say that he's going to put the pressure on him to go. So everybody let Comic Ozzy know that he has to go now. Neil says, I love X-Men Adventures 1, have had that in 9-8 for a long time. Well, there was finally a 9-8 sale that that came from the show being out. Like it took it took a while for, you know, there were so many 9-8 sales when everything was going on. And then, and then eventually like nobody was buying the book anymore. And then finally we got a 9-8 sale, like within the last two weeks. You know, it took a while. Um Mickey, you go. You doing San Diego? Yes, I will definitely be doing San Diego Comic Con. I will definitely be doing San Diego Comic Con. I'm not sure if I'm going to be doing Heroes Con. I'm looking at NYCC. I'm looking at NYCC. Uh, looks like I will be there on Sunday. Oh, Sunday uh, for C2E2. Uh, cartoons are the reason comic values hold. I told my a friend of mine this many years ago. Cartoons are the reason. Well. Do you mean like cartoons are the things that keep the cultural relevance alive? Because I, I agree with you there. Cartoons haven't been moving values at all until we got um, until we got the Into the Spider Verse and now X Men ninety seven. It's been a while since cartoons have been able to have any sort of like movement on the market in any significant way, and then even Invincible, which. I don't know what's going on with Invincible Season 2, but I haven't looked at that book's value in a while. And I wonder what it's doing. I mean, I assume like every other book, it's had its pullbacks just because of the economy. But I wonder if there's been any eyeballs going back to it. Uh, Illuminati, Illuminati, what's going on, man? CGC on-site grading at Heroes Comic Con this year. The free money and grading casino is back. Well, everyone's sending X-Men books once again. You know, it's time time to get your 9-9 X-Mens. Uh, San Diego. Okay. Yeah, Comic Doctor, I will be there in San Diego for sure. So anyways, I, 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 share, I share with you guys, you know, the trending 20 list just to show you like how much X-Men is on it and specifically X-Men related books, which again, I always find fascinating. And what's even crazier about this is you go here to go collect trending, uh, trending list, which if you guys remember, I used to cover this trending list for a long time. And then Matt Tuck, who writes it, uh, took some time off doing the list. 
And so I didn't end up doing videos on it. Let me know if you would like me to do videos on this stuff. I always feel like some people like, you know, the, the hot lists and covering them. Some people don't like it. Um, I think it's always interesting to look at. I don't know if it makes for the most entertaining videos all the time to cover the list, but either way, we're going to cover it very quickly in this section here on stream. Some books that you guys are going to know why um, they're hot here. Silver Surfer with uh, the Shala Ball version of Silver Surfer. And really why I pull up the list to talk about with you guys as it relates to the thumbnail of X-Men 97 is that Giant Size X-Men is on the list. And this book, since the show, has also been one of the hottest books in the market. I, I mean, it feels like perfect timing. You know, you get the 9-9 coming out. That's big news. And then you also have X-Men 97. And this book actually is one of the hottest books that's out there right now. It's it's so crazy to see that. Uh, Swag do Beyond Wednesday's Hot 10. Well, you know, I, I shout out to Brian and Beyond Wednesdays. That, that, that crew is great. You know, one of the reasons why I covered the Go Collect one is because nobody on YouTube was really covering it. So I was like, oh, okay, let me, I could be the person that, that, that does content on this. And I think all the hot lists are, they have their own like way in which they do coverage of books and how they evaluate it. The way that Go Collect does it is it's based on volume increase. So it's not necessarily the trending book, meaning like, oh, this had the most sales. It is the most, all of a sudden, this book is selling a lot more than what it was. So that's one way to measure. And it's also uh, weighted towards graded comic books. So it's graded comic books and then volume of increase. And that's how this one does its thing. Whereas like the Key Collector Trending 20 is really based on, I think, the hottest selling books that week. You know, so, so there's a slight difference, but but all of it can be very informative of how it's doing the calculation of like, okay, well, what does this mean, you know, in terms of what's going on in pop culture, what's going on in the market? Imagine buying all these hot books raw on eBay and send them direct to grading and to an online marketplace. Wait, Neo, we're going to talk about that in a second. I'm not even there yet. We're still going through all the books, but hold on to that thought. Everybody in the chat too. Hold on to that thought. Um, so we have Giant Size X-Men. Still, you know, big book. You guys know what it is. Colossus, Storm, Nightcrawler. We got the 9-9 nine, nine out. And this is one of the hottest books, even off of the heels of the show, which is amazing. Does death move books? This is what we need to know. Does death move comic books? Well, in the case of X-Men 266, Maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit. I mean, we all know what it is, guys. You know, again, spoilers, spoilers in the, the, the house. Gambit died in the last episode. He died, guys, he died. And he went out with a bang and he said to remember his name. And it felt like a lot of comic book collectors needed to remember his name. Because here you have a book which always sells, it's always popular. It's There's always tons of you know uh, interest in this book. But I think you could make the argument that there was just a slight, slight uptick, slight uptick of Gambit-related sales after his episode. Anytime, you know, there's, there's character, character death, people get excited about the stuff. You know, this is one of the reasons why Marvel even, you know how like Marvel has that thing where they, they always do like, whenever Doctor Strange's movie is coming out, they, they launch a series where it's like death of Doctor Strange. There's a reason for this because what they've actually concluded is that people think that the death stuff is important and, and they're always drawn to it when it happens. And so with the gambit here, People were drawn to it. I mean, we actually saw a lot of, of volume, a lot of volume of sales here. And I went into the nine eights and we didn't get, we got, we got two nine eights after the fact. Now we're not going to say that, that, that there's, you know, higher prices. They're, they're not higher prices, but you know, it's been, uh, it's been finding the floor. It's been a little bit resistant, you know, 750 here earlier in April, 700 at the nine eight level, 675, 695. You go back to January, 
kind of the same, maybe a little lower. Like you see a 576 in there, you see a 650 high, but then a 607, a 552, a 680, there's a 700. So depends on the, the day, but it, it, it kind of feels like this, this book is finally finding its floor. And it's finally finding its floor. GSX-1, CGC-99 will more than likely rise all of CGC grades below. Probably. Probably. I mean, that's part of the machine, right? Like, here, here's something I got to say, guys. So I was at WonderCon, and maybe you guys saw my talk to dealer video thing. And I mentioned it in the, in the video. But if you didn't see it, we were, I was at WonderCon, and I was... You know, we were talking about the the giant size X Men one nine nine, and there was a lot of conversation about it. Of like, okay, what what is it going to sell for, or whatever? And I talked to one person who, pretty nonchalantly, said to me that he would buy it for three hundred k, like for sure. He's like, yeah, I would throw three hundred k at it. And I was when when he said that, I was like, oh wow, like if if you're that casual about it then maybe this is going to be a book that sells for like 500K. Because at the time I was like, nah, 100, right? Or 200K, maybe maybe 250, something like that. But yeah, I think, I think it's going to sell for a lot. I think it's going to sell for a lot. For sure. Uh, Mika says, Swag, I noticed your more recent pickups were raw and slammed. Are you avoiding slabs? Uh, no, I'm not avo avoiding slabs. I had a... Um, Pick up of, uh, what was it? Uh, Haunted Thrills, number six, the skeleton cover. That was a, that was a slab. Um, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not actively avoiding it. You know, to me, it's like, I just want to find the best price for everything. That's, that's always my, my approach. And so sometimes like you're kind of put in a situation where if it's a golden age book, well, you're, you're going to have to sort of buy the slab. I mean, most golden age books that are like keys are going to already be slab. Um, I mean, a lot of silver age keys are already going to be slab, you know? It's very rare that you can find, say, a raw AF15 or a raw ASM1. You know, it, it's, it's hard to find those types of books. So it really just depends. It really just depends. Yeah, 300K to splurge on a comic book must be nice. Must be nice. Half a million. Could be. It could be. Anyways, back to what we were saying. X-Men 266, does death increase sales of books? A little bit. A little bit. And um, speaking of more death, guys, can we get a RIP in the chat for Leech, man? I mean, I know it was sad for Gambit, but what about Leech, though? What about Leech, though? RIP in the chat. Pour one out for Leech. You know, that was sad. That was sad, too. There were so many good lines in this in this episode, I'm so impressed with how many dimes there were. There was, you know, it's funny, the, the, the in WandaVision, Vision had a really good line that I think for, as far as phase four lines were concerned, I was like, okay, that's the best line that, that came out of it. But I think that this episode might've topped it with some of the lines. But in case you guys don't know, X-Men 179, first appearance of Leech, you know, everyone's favorite animated X-Men Morlock. And, uh, you know, Leech, he went down with the, he went down, he went down with the ship. He went down with the ship. And, uh, I wanted to see if people wanted to buy Leech and sure enough, guys, look at this. April 14th, brand new nine, eight, $64 sale, instant buy, instant buy for Leech. I thought that was pretty cool. I mean, $64 for a 9.8, that's not bad, right? I mean, the price of the slab is like 30. Price of the book is five, you know, $40. So you're paying a $20 premium to say, hey, you did the work, give me the book. That's not bad. That's not a bad, that's not a bad pickup if, if Leech is your guy. Now, will it ever sell for more than $64? Probably not, but hey, you know, and, and so anyways, I, I say that because, you know, I wanted to do the market thing. I wanted to dig in. I was like, okay, are people buying up the leech books? And, you know, inconclusive, inconclusive guys, 
but we did get a nine, eight sale. And I thought that that was pretty funny. Like that was pretty cool. You know, who, who's the guy out there that's been stacking leech nine eights ready to capitalize. It's pretty amazing. All right. What else did I have here? I have so many tabs, guys. I have so many tabs. We, have, we, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. Wait, I lost my place. All right. So we have Leech there. And then, <laughs> and then I got really, really invested in the episode. And I was like, <laughs> who is that character? I have to know their first appearance. And yeah, I may lose my cool card with you guys if you guys always knew about Glob Herman. But as soon as I saw Glob Herman, I was like, who is that? I got to look up his first appearance. I got to see if anyone else is buying Glob Herman books. Guys, Glob Herman is a tragic figure. Glob Herman has it way worse than Beast. He's got it way worse than Nightcrawler. He's got it so much worse than any mutant that was born with blue or green or whatever skin. This guy is a gelatinous, gelatinous blob. Glob Herman, man, showing up in the episode. Do you guys think that Glob Herman made it out of Genosha? I'm willing to bet that he did. <laughs> I'm willing to bet he did. I was reading his bio earlier today. He's got like worthless powers, guys. He can like be set on fire or something. But other, way, other than that, he's just a blob. Like this guy is up there with the kid whose mutant power it is to blink and change the television channel. Like that's that's what this guy has going for it. Like how, how much would that suck? It's like, oh, this guy was born as Magneto and I was born as a gelatinous blob. Well, either way, X-Men 117, guys, did you know that this is the first appearance of Glob Herman? I didn't know until I looked it up. And then I was curious, did anyone actually buy this book in the wake of the episode? And I got to say, I think people did. I actually think that per, per capita there were more sales of this book relative to the episode than there were, say, previously. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But we did get a 9-6. Again, I always think about, like, who are the people that they're like, oh, yeah, dude, Glob Herman Speck, New X-Men, 117. How is this a 9-6? I mean, what are you going to do with your 9-6 version of this book? So sad, you know? Blob Herman Jello Molds for X-Men 97 viewing party. Dude, that's a three rivers. That's actually not a bad idea. Glob Herman is cool, but not as cool as soft serve. I'm just saying. All right. Well, enough fun here. There's other X-Men books that are interesting. And, and we're going to go back to what Neo was saying with the instant click into the spec stuff. And I think that this is important. So where is it all going, right? There's been so many talks about like, oh, okay, maybe Nimrod. You know, maybe it's going to be a Nimrod thing. Maybe it's going to be a Master Mold thing. I mean, we already know we've been getting Master Mold, X-Men 15. I don't really know if there's been any sort of more movement for this book. I think that this is just a book that sells based on if you're trying to put together an X-Men run or not. Um, maybe there's some Nimrod movement, but this is always a spec book. Either way, the big spec now, guys, is Bastion. Everyone's talking about Bastion. If you guys don't know, Bastion is a mix between Master Mold and Nimrod, if I have that correct. Excuse me if I don't. And this seems to be the character that it's all building to. You know, Bastion has some connections with Onslaught and Mr. Sinister and some of that stuff from the comic books, but everybody right now, all the all the blogs, all the, you know, the the media uh, is talking about how Bastion's gonna be the the sort of the big blow-off villain. And again, 
back to the main topic at hand. This is what makes it so crazy is that hold on to your butts. X-Men 333, first full appearance of Bastion. I should say uncanny X-Men 333, first full appearance of Bastion. And then X-Men 52, first cameo of Bastion. Already, guys, these books are blowing up. These things are, are going crazy. Low key, like just just wait. Next next week, next trending twenty list, next uh, whatever, next FOMO book of the week. This is the one. This is the one right here. Uncanny X Men three thirty three. Everybody has been buying every single copy. I mean, guys, I'm still going. My finger, my finger. Okay, right there. This is pre pre show. You know, pre-show, you know, some sales, but you got to go into March and stuff. Got to go into February. And then after the episode, starting here, look at that. Boom. Every single copy going on sale right there. Still paying the low price, you know, $10 now, but it was $250 earlier this morning. Someone was like, give me that 9.8. I'm taking it right now taking it right now for $108. And this is kind of where, uh, you know, what Neil was kind of getting at and, and what I think is so interesting. If you guys don't know, in fact, let me just quickly, let me see if I can quickly pull this up. Um, I did this video earlier in the week. Maybe you guys already saw it. Uh, that was about PSA. And maybe I need to cut a short out of this because Nobody watches the entire videos. Nobody, nobody's got the attention for this stuff. I probably, it's probably my fault, probably long winded on all of my videos. So I apologize, but you know, if you go in here, hold on, I, I, sorry, I had to pull this up. All right. You go in here and you see this video I did right here. eBay acquires golden. eBay acquires golden. Now maybe uh, there's some comic collector people that were like eBay acquiring golden PSA, blah, blah, blah. I don't care, whatever, whatever. But the main talking point in this video towards the end was why this could be huge for comic books. And going back to a situation like this and what Neil was kind of implying earlier is you have companies like PSA and eBay joining forces and vaults and all that sort of thing. And with their integration, you could see a world where you buy this book, right? And as you buy the book upon checkout, since eBay and PSA are connected, you, you, you buy it upon checkout. It, it then asks you a different prompt. Like, would you like to send this book to be graded at PSA, for instance? You know, some kind of program like that. And you can instant buy books and then have them instant graded. And based on how the vaults are, are working, which vaults to, again, to recount what, what I was talking about in the video is like sort of a, a remote kind of warehouse to like exchange all your comic books. You could have PSA graded and then they can sort of instantly relist the book as a graded book through your vault back onto eBay. And you never actually have to get the book in hand. You never actually have to like send it out to be graded. And you never have to take the pictures or you never have to do the whatever. And you can sort of instantly relist the graded version of that book up for sale. Are you guys following me on here? Is this not blowing your minds? Do you not see a world where you get a book like this and you buy it for $2 and then you have PSA grade it? And even if PSA is not the premier company, even if they aren't you know, the same secondary market value as CGC, you know, let's say they, com they command 80% of the value. So the 9.8 only sells for $80. You could buy your $2.50 book through eBay, have it instantly graded, have it instantly relisted re at $80 and then sell it for $80 without having to do any of the work. That's going to be crazy. I think that that is the future that is coming. And I think that why that's such a big deal is, again, if it is true, 
if it is true that PSA might get into graded comic books, yes, they're going to have an uphill battle trying to like outdo CGC values. But if it's that easy and it's that convenient to buy raw, grade, and relist and sell, and you can make margin on a book like this, like, do you really care? Like, do you need to sell for a hundred bucks? Like you can sell for 75. You bought the book for five, you know, I don't know. That could be crazy. That could be crazy. I'm picking up what you're putting down. I enjoyed when I blew your mind with this on the phone. I mean, dude, it did blow my mind. Wait, PSA grading comic now or something might happen in the future. There's been talk. There's been talk. PSA graded comic books, gross. Illuminati says, Swag, tell your audience what is the most important business hiring they need to do before they even consider starting to grade comic books. Well, Illuminati, I've heard things that one of the most important things that you need to have to be a reputable grading company is to have people who can spot restoration. Because if you can't spot restoration, well, then the whole thing is a is a sham, right? Grading is a sham. I know. Okay, I know, I know. But if you can't spot resto, it's going to be even a bigger sham because that's going to be one of the things that like you need to be able to identify all this stuff. Now, is it really going to matter in these situations where, you know, all of a sudden Bastion becomes the book and then everybody here instantly wants to buy it out? Maybe it doesn't matter. I mean, like, what are the chances that this copy is color touch? Probably zero, right? Probably. But yeah, it does matter for, for vintage. It does matter for vintage, for sure. Um, that is certainly a value prop differentiator. I mean, it could be huge. It could be huge. Um, if you had to start a grading scale from scratch, what would it be? Well, this is really interesting. And why I think the PSA thing is interesting, if they start grading comic books and they decide to make their 9.8 a 10. Like if they just come out of the gate, PSA 10. I mean, guys, lizard brain tells me that 10 is bigger than 9.8. Lizard brain tells me that 10 is even better than 9.9. I feel like you just go 10. Just make it a 10. I mean, everyone already kind of feels like, oh, the difference between a 9.8 and 9.9 and 10 is, is marginal anyways. So just call it a 10. PSA 10. PSA 9.5, PSA 9. That's it. You got mint, near mint, near mint minus. I think that that probably just makes sense. And I realized that like all the little, you know, nuance of like, I can understand why, what, why their method at the high end was to have it be 9.8, 9.6, 9.4, et cetera, et cetera. I can understand the philosophy behind that, but I'm willing to bet that they would have preferred, if you could wave a magic wand, if I could get Matt on the channel, which again, I want to get Matt on the channel. Matt, if you're out there, we're going to talk soon. Um, but I bet if you could get them to wave a magic wand and change their scale to start over, I'm sure that they would have said like, yeah, we should have given nine nines, the nine eight treatment from the beginning, for sure. I would go 10, skip nine nine, go to nine eight. Yeah, I agree. I mean, <laughs> let's just go to 11 guys. I'm going to go to 11, hundred percent. Either way, enough about that. I thought that that was really interesting. Everything going on with the merger of PSA and, um, or, or acquiring eBay's vault. And I would expect to see some kind of these integrations in the future. And I point to this because this is the convergence of what we're discussing here, where you have a hot show like X-Men 97, already going to make the first full appearance of Bastion, the hottest book this week. And, uh, you know, guys, if you're out there hunting, you know, you're flipping through those bins. I guarantee you this is in dollar bins everywhere. Go, go pull out this book. Um, you'll be able to instantly sell it at a 9.8 or a PSA 10. And PSA 10 is better than CGC 9.8. Uh, other little thing before I move on with the Bastion thing, there's also this. 
X Men 52, first cameo appearance, Sebastian. I mean, this one is also selling a lot. I mean, again, scroll, 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 Benny Hill music. Not as much as X Men 33, but you know, hey, if you find it in a dollar bin, maybe you want to pull it out, but uh, don't get too excited. All right, I already did the work. I pulled up Marvel Unlimited, guys. There you go. This panel right here, there's your first cameo of Bastion in this book. I mean, like, do we, do we really feel like this is a key? Like, do I feel like I'm getting, hold on. There we go, guys. You buy X-Men 52 and you're like, yeah, I own the first Bastion. I mean, is it worth it? No, right? That's, that's the cameo. So go get 333 because then you get this one. You get this. There you go. My name is Bastion. As most of you already know, I have come to set us free. Way cooler. Way cooler than Guy in trench coat. So there you have it, guys. There you have it. All right, let me check back in with the chat real quick. What are you guys talking about? Uh, PSA will for sure do better than CBCS. Best chance of a real number two in the market. And for God's sakes, three letters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Three instead of four. Uh, CBSS was dead in the water just from that. Man, you know what's funny about the CBCS thing? And again, I'm not trying to be mean. I just like to make jokes. But I did that little short. We talked about the House of Secrets 92 that sold for $58,000 compared to the CGC counterparts of 84 and 90 earlier. And that's tough, man. Like that right there is the reason why, you know, again, it doesn't matter, you know, what brand you want or whatever, or it doesn't matter like, like what kind of mistakes CGC makes. I mean, maybe there's a certain level that it does matter, but for the most part, until the monetary aspect corrects, until that's closer, I mean, it's going to be hard for people to ever decide to send to, you know, CBCS over CGC. What it's, what's exciting about what I was getting at with the PSA and all the stuff is all of a sudden it becomes like, okay, here's like a value prop. That's kind of different than just the pure secondary market value. And that is kind of where it's like, okay, maybe there's something here that can actually start to enact change. But, you know, even if you don't care about values, you know, everyone is a collector until they're not. You know, at a certain point, you know, you guys may want to hand your books down to your kids or you may want to hand your books down to loved ones or, or move on with them. Or maybe something happens in your life. You got to come up with some cash. You got to pay a bill. You got to move a book, you know, and and when that time comes, you know, you want to get the most money you can out of it. I mean, it only just makes sense. You know, it just makes sense. And so that's kind of why for the most part, people are going to continue to choose CGC. Everyone will become a comic flipper. Never have to leave your couch or ship a book, dude. Just put put in the uh, put in the um, what do you call it? The uh, the treasure hunters out of business, like the Freddy flips type of guys. You know, going to the garage sales and stuff. You know, if it becomes way more efficient, it's just be like, let me just do it from the couch. We can never leave. We can finally live our Wally existence in comic books. Uh, what do you think the sales numbers were for those late nineties books? A hundred K for top 10. Well, yeah, in the nineties, everything was printed like crazy numbers, like if not a million close to a million. So a lot of nineties books have extremely high print runs. When you start to get to like, I could be wrong. Maybe someone can correct me in the chat. If you guys really know the details. Well, when you start to get to like late nineties, 98, 99, and then 2000 through like, 2008, maybe, um, that window tends to be a little bit more difficult to find because they had been doing so poorly that they didn't have to print so many. So there's much less supply, but yeah, all these books like X-Men 333 and, you know, even 266 Gambit, you know, all these books have very, very high print counts out there. Um, Hey, that guy from Sanity has the same style of hair like yours. Does he? That wasn't intentional. Maybe it's because my artist drew it that way. Uh, just scanned the QR code for, for on the Sanity number one I got from King Kong 
uh, scanned it, hoping it would uh, take me to order issue two. Yes, well, sadly, uh, Zebo, I had to make those flyers before I had the Kickstarter up. So I had to get it to Greg and the and the King Kong team. So uh, I, I couldn't, I didn't have the QR code correctly. So I just had it navigate to my channel and everything like that. Um, but hey, in case you do want to order it, I got the Kickstarter going on right now, guys. Three days left. Three days left on the Kickstarter for issues two and three. You can also get issue one if you didn't get it. Um, I see that you did get it. Just finished reading it. Great so far. Love, love crafting horror. Hey, I appreciate that. Thank you so much for reading it and checking it out. Um, but yeah, the Kickstarter link is in the description if you guys want to support it. We got to 197. We got to 197. That's pretty good in the time of the stream. Just hit 22,000. Maybe we can get to 200. Let's get to 200, guys. That would be awesome. Be a very satisfying number to hit. Um, all right. Let's take a look here. Um, see what else you guys are saying. A couple other things to, to say. Uh, I have some other news that we're going to cover uh, soon here. Uh, the buyer of the CBCS 98 scored huge. A seller should have used a buy it now. Well, yeah, the, the buyer did score huge. I mean, there is risk, right? Like if they want to crack it out and send into CGC, they might get the 96, in which case I think the 96, the last sale for that was more around the $30,000 range. So there are definitely, there's definitely risk there, but you know, as far as looking at the book, like zooming in on the scans, it looked like a legit nine eight. Like it wasn't one of those nine eights where you zoom in and you're like, oh my God, like, you know, I, I can make like a funny meme out of it. Uh, it looked like a legit nine eight. So they definitely scored. Uh, as far as the seller, I mean, you never know, right? Like maybe this is like the seller's original copy that they've owned for, you know, however long, like they bought it off the shelf, the rack for a dollar. So they're, so for them, they're coming up no matter what you would hope that that's their situation. And maybe that's why they chose to send it to CBCS because they were just sort of like, yeah, well, what, what does it matter? You know, I'm already going to make $50,000 on this either way. So, uh, you know, might as well just send it to this company versus CGC. You know, I, I don't know what the story behind it was, but either way, they could have already made their margin. Uh, when you dump in tens and even hundreds of thousands on this stuff, it's not it's not just a collection anymore. Um, well, it's definitely not. I mean, people are playing with big money, you know, once, once they're spending that kind of thing on it. Uh, can we get some yellow labels on our sanities? Well, apparently now we can, right, with JSA. Uh, I'm still waiting for the official press release to come out with JSA. But, uh, well, actually, I, I shouldn't speak. I, I shouldn't get ahead of myself because JSA we don't know that it's going to be yellow label. That's just my guess that it's going to be that. But there are some copies that they have signed that CGC did witness that exist. Some people have them. Um, let me see what else is people talking about. Uh, if X books are this hyped based off the cartoon, what's going to happen when they come to live action? That's the million dollar question, guys. That's the million dollar question because will it be as good as live action? You know, I mean, will it be as good? I'm starting to get a little bit of faith that this show is good, but it also could just be that, you know, animation, they have more hands off and they're not paying as much attention to it as they are the live action stuff. Which brings us to the next part of you know some of the news we got to talk about we got some uh, cinemacon news talking about marvel projects are you guys excited about marvel projects anymore i mean like we've been talking about 97 we're excited about it definitely how are you guys feeling about like wolverine and deadpool like are you guys day one theater watchers for that or are you like wait and see type of thing either way set photos coming out for john bernthal Punisher with Charlie Cox Daredevil. So we know that we're going to get Punisher in the Daredevil show, which is pretty cool. Now, what I think is interesting is the Daredevil Born Again show was shelved, essentially, and they restarted it. I actually know somebody who was a producer on the Daredevil Born Again series. And what they told me, based on what they told me, I was like, this is good that they're restarting it. You know, this is good that they're restarting it because it was not going to be anything like the Netflix series. 
That was the initial version of the show. Apparently things changed. You know, they had to redo it. Page one rewrite. And now it seems like they're going to be getting that Netflix, Netflix version. And uh, we're going to be seeing Punisher in this. And that's pretty cool. Because it leads us to, again, sort of the next talking point, which is Punisher's back, man. Like Punisher's back. Like if you guys don't know, you, you ever use Go Collect? I think you have to be a subscriber here. But if you go to this tab called Market Overview, you can actually sort by hottest comics as they have them. And you can go into the tabs and see, okay, like what are the hottest uh, Silver Age comic books? And it'll tell you. And this is hottest based on volume. That's how Go Collect does this. And this is a big part of how I determined what books are on my comic index. If you guys know my index that I do. What I did was I was like, I went to Go Collect's, okay, what are the hottest comics of the 365 days? And these were the top 100 that I used to do my calculations. So FF48, Silver Surfer 1, ASM50, FF52, Iron Man 1, et cetera, Rhino, Submariner, blah, 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 blah. Anyways, they have these tabs that are very, very cool to look at. And you can see, okay, what are the top Bronze Age comic books and stuff? And it's cool to see, you know? I think Punisher is Punisher is in there. You know, he's his book's moving again. Giant Size X-Men climbing up once again. And I think even Daredevil was not in the top 10, but in the past 30 days, yeah, he was number 11 here. So these books are, you know, there's still some demand here. There's still some demand for this stuff. And um, it'll be interesting to see what's going to happen with this show. I mean, I don't think, I think that, you know, we're never going to go back to a world where you have FOMO buying, like, like instant, I'm going to hit buy it now on eBay for a four figure book because I saw a trailer. I don't know if we're ever going to go back to that because I, I can't imagine that the hype will ever be that big. I mean, you might get the occasional one-off purchase, but the run-up that we saw in COVID, there's no way that's ever going to happen again. That said, though, it doesn't mean that these books won't be targeted once we have people excited about the show. It's kind of like case in point with Giant Size X-Men 1. You know, we have X-Men 97 getting people to, to think about making their purchase and having eyeballs on it. So that's what I think that we'll see with this. And it feels like we're already starting to get that, you know, where we're starting to see, um, ASM 129 getting kind of hot. I wouldn't be surprised if we see ASM 129 pop up as soon as, uh, or, or I should say, I wouldn't be surprised if an ASM 129 99 pops up, you know, once we get kind of close to the born again series, I mean, wouldn't that be convenient guys? Wouldn't that be convenient? Uh, was that the new Punisher logo on John Bernthal photo? Yeah, let's take a look. It does kind of, well, what do you guys think? Can you guys tell? Can't really zoom here. Is that the new logo? It kind of looks new-ish. And it is pretty lame that they changed his logo. You know? Like, it, it's, I mean, listen, I'm shooting from the hip here. I haven't really fully thought this through. I don't really even know why they changed the logo was because a bunch of NRA people like were using it or something and they didn't like that or they, they thought that they were worried about that. But like, I kind of feel like what, what happens outside in culture, like you can't control that. Right. So just because he has the logo, doesn't mean that he stands for whatever people use the logo for, but I guess we're kind of in that space. We're kind of in that world. Uh, read Deadpool three. I'm concerned because it's not the same creative team. I think Reese and Wernick are just kind of consulting on the script. I have concerns. Yeah, that's a good point. Could be like a little bit of lack of consistency there. You do have Ryan Reynolds. And then who's the director? Sean Levy directed it. I'm not a big fan of Sean Levy's films. I think he's done some okay movies. You know, like he's done some decent movies. I think he made, what did he make? He made like Night at the Museum. He made, um, I wonder some of the stuff. Night at the Museum. He made that that Rock'em Sock'em Robots movie with Hugh Jackman. What was that one? You guys remember that with that, that random movie? Um, he's okay. He's okay. 
So like, is the movie going to be Dune 2? Probably not. Probably not. All right, what about this movie, guys? Coming out of CinemaCon here, Kevin Feige confirms Thunderbolts is the official title. We won't talk about the Asterix until after the release. So as you, as you guys can see from the uh, screen grab right here, Thunderbolts with a little bit of an Asterix up there. Now, a lot of people are saying that the reason it's called Thunderbolts is because, or th there's an asterisk, is it because it's going to be the Dark Avengers reveal? Everybody knows what this book is. Dark Avengers, Dark Ren, Brian Michael Bendis, number one. I mean, fun book to own. Is it ever really going to be a book that goes crazy? I don't know. I don't know. Real Steel. Yep, that was it, guys. Real Steel. You know, like, so he makes an okay movie. They're okay. They're They're fine. Uh, and he made the, uh, what's it called? The Ryan Reynolds one where he's inside the video game, you know? So, you know. Um, but anyways, a lot of people talking right now, Th Thunderbolts is going to be, uh, maybe there's going to be two movies here. So it'll be Thunderbolts, the first one, and then it's going to go to Dark Avengers number one. I mean, I can see what they're trying to do here, right? If you ever listen to Kevin Feige talk about um, his plan for Infinity War and Endgame and what Civil War was designed to do and all that st sort of thing, it's like Civil War is supposed to be the like uh, the Dark Knight of the Soul moment for the broader MCU story. So the Dark Knight of the Soul, you know, is like a writing term, guys. You know, you you get to that point, the, the, the what do you call it? Like the somewhere in the the uh, three fourths through the movie, right? When the character thinks like, oh man, I'm not going to be able to defeat the villain, right? So you get to that moment. That's what Civil War kind of represents within that, right? You have a, a split amongst the team. And I think that uh, they're trying to hit those same notes and those beats with like Thunderbolts and then it'll be Dark Avengers. And then it's like, oh, the reason they can't stop Kang, if Kang is still the real villain, is because the Avengers team is not really the Avengers team. They're the Dark Avengers team. So that, that's kind of why I think that they're, they're setting all this stuff up. And I don't know, very, very interesting that they're going to do, that they would do two movies on this property. Some people swear by the Thunderbolts, but... I don't know. I, I I can't say that I've ever, I was a big Thunderbolt reader and, and I can't say that I, I'm somebody that's convinced this is going to work out, but you know, Hey, we'll see. We'll have to see. But maybe you think about Incredible Hulk 449. Remember this book guys? Like, can you guys think about this? Dude, nine, this was a thousand dollars in nine, eight. This was a thousand dollars. That's crazy. And what's even more crazy is that after it went back down to 500, it went back up to $800. And where it sells now? 266. Last sale for 9266, guys. That's a down 5x, down 500%. Now, if you're somebody who actually wants this book, I mean, Now's as good a time as any to buy it. Like, you know, it's like you go back to this book, even in 2017, still $200. You know, before there was ever talks of Thunderbolts, it was still $200, 9.8. This last sale is 266. I mean, it's not that bad, all things considered. So if you're somebody who wants to buy it, I mean, now is as good a time as any to buy that book. You know what I mean? But anyways... Thunderbolt's coming. Probably going to be Dark Avengers. Everyone's talking about this. So keep your eye out for that one. Again, don't buy it on eBay. Just find these things in dollar bins. Speaking of dollar bins, guys, next little bit of news. Kit Harrington has a bleak update about his MCU future. The honest answer is nothing's in the works at the moment. Damn, dude. Just because nothing's in the works doesn't mean nothing is in the works. Right? Guys, has there ever... Ha, what are... I, I feel like... You know what would be a good video? Like, we got to make... I got to make a video that are like top 10... What should we call it? Like the top 10 folliest from grace books or something. 
right? Like for, for historical purposes, we almost need to have it on the record. Like what are the ultimate 2021 FOMO, like from, from hero to zero type of books that are out there? I feel like this is, this is one of them. You know, this is one of them. Eternals one is on there. Special Marvel edition 15 is maybe on there, but even that book, like, you know, maybe there's hope for a book like that, but West coast Avengers 45 white vision. That's gotta be on there. Right. Is a uh, Agatha Harkness on there. I mean, that's gotta be on there from hero to zero. From hero to zero, that's catchy. Top 10 worst three-year buys. FOMO fails. The alliteration, that's good. FOMO fails. Top 10 biggest FOMO drops in comic book history. History. But yeah, I mean, you see this? I mean... I don't put too much stock in this You with, with him as an actor, they're going to want to utilize him hundred percent. Like he's a name he draws probably. Um, actually, actually, I don't know that he draws. Maybe he doesn't draw to theaters, but he's a name. People are familiar with him and, uh, they probably are going to do something with him, but look at this book, man. Look at the nine sixes. This one actually had a recent sale and it was actually pretty good. 2,200. That's not bad. All things considered, but, 5,800 at the peak, 2,200 now. Let's go to the seven O's. This is crazy. This is a book that was 1,200 bucks, seven O. Now, $152. $152. That's worse than Thunderbolts. That deserves crazy hair. Twelve hundred bucks down to one fifty three seven zero. Before that, though, it wasn't even a, a book. Nobody even slabbed it at that grade. It was forty nine dollars in twenty eighteen. So crazy. I believe in Black Knight. All right, what are you guys saying here? I like that Aaron's in memory memoriam. Yeah, to Dead Spec Books. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to Aaron. That's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, favorite fifteen FOMO fails. Just four Fs, four Fs. My gift to you, I appreciate it. Uh, what about Black Knight tie-ins to Blade? Actually, never mind. They probably retconned them in one of the 30 rewrites. Yeah, they probably did. He was at one point in the script and then they took him out. But man, uh, Thunderbolts is like D tier IP at best. That's going to be a Sony level bomb straight up. Who is going to be go to the theater for that? Yeah, dude. You're so right. Like, like just name brand alone, Thunderbolts. Like, there's no way. There's no, like, think of all your, think of all your, like, your friends that are like, okay, let me start over again. Think about if you had friends. And <laughs> if, if you had friends, those, they would be casual MCU watchers. And those casual friend MCU watchers, they don't know what Thunderbolts is. Like they're going to be like Thunderbolts. They're not even going to know it's a Marvel branded thing. It's going to be so hard. Like they're going to have to wear Florence Pugh all over the billboards as hard as they can. And even that, like Florence Pugh, like I don't know if she moves the needle enough. I wonder if they're actually going to change the title to Dark Avengers. Because at least here you say you get Avengers. Although I got to think that they're precious with the word Avengers. There's no way that they would dilute their brand using the word Avengers. But I don't know. Pretty crazy. Anyways, I thought that was interesting with Avengers 48, what Kit Harrington was saying. And uh, yeah, you know, this book uh, could be, uh, you know, of your FOMO fails. One of the books on that list. But let's end with a little bit of a positive note here. Something I thought was interesting that I would share with you guys in case you didn't see it. Robert Downey Jr. would happily return of course he would. If there were that many zeros in my bank account, I too would happily return. 
to the Marvel Cinematic Universe after Oscar win. It's too integral a part of my DNA. That role chose me. And look, I always say, never ever bet against Kevin Feige. It is a losing bet. He's the house. He will always win. That's uh, some high praise from Robert Downey Jr. right there. I mean, obviously he's coming back. Obviously he's going to be in Secret Wars. No character ever dies. We know this. You know, we know this. Um, he's totally going to come back. And, you know, this was the thing that reminded me about Marvel and MCU. I made this one video, guys. Probably didn't see it. Uh, this one here, Wrestling Comics. Shout out to the wrestling fans out there. If you guys don't know, WrestleMania just happened. And I made this video uh, kind of in the wake of it because I thought, hey, wrestling is back. And I say that because I think WWE wrestling is, is maybe the best example of cinematic universes before there were cinematic universes. A persisting story that goes on and on and on throughout the decades, has to always mirror culture, has to always cash in on nostalgia, and has had a lot of criticism where a lot of peaks or, or that wrestling will never hit the same sort of peaks that it did, that it once did. And that's probably true. Same with Marvel and the MCU, probably never going to hit some of the peaks that it once did. But like wrestling, every now and again, the sun can shine on it. You know, every now and again, it can come back and people will be excited, even if it is just for a moment in time, like a WrestleMania. And that's what I think we're going to get here. Again, like he's saying, never bet against Kevin Feige. I think at a certain point, it's going to be good again. He's going to come back and we're going to have a fun movie at least when Robert Downey Jr. shows up. But until then, we can cherish what we get with X-Men 97, because that's been good. And uh, it's cool to see books actually moving. You know, like, not in, like, a FOMO spec way. I mean, we can kind of make fun of it. You know, I always like to cover the books that are moving. It's always fun to talk about, like, FOMO spec stuff or whatever. But I, I genuinely feel like the X-Men books are moving in a different way. Like, yes, it's FOMO, but if it, it's a little bit different than that. It's like FOMO, but it's really like churned fans and casual collectors being brought in. And they don't really have any concern about, oh, the book being $15 more than it should be. I think it's just mostly like the casuals coming back and saying, I remember Gambit. Hey, I remember the show. Hey, let me pick up a 266. That's fun. And they just buy it. Like, that's what it is. You know, is it FOMO? Mm, not really. It's just more people coming, kind of coming back. So I think that that's kind of where we're at with X-Men. And uh, it's been cool to watch. Uh, Alan says, are you still buying grails these days with a down market? Uh, yeah, I'm still buying grails for sure. I mean, I I have my uh, comic book index video. Well, guys, guys, I did an update to it uh, maybe a week ago. And that has always been sort of my like temperature check on where the market is. And if it's a book that I want, should I buy it? What do I think is a good price? Again, it's not a perfect system. I'm not saying like, I know I can't, I can't tell what's going to happen. Everything's probably going to go to zero at some point, but yeah, if it's a book that I want and I feel like it's a good deal and I want it, I'll buy it. Now I tend to be somebody who likes to collect more silver age and some golden age stuff. And then I'll buy things that are good opportunities or, or being sold at discount. Um, so would I buy a grail? Like I probably wouldn't be so quick to buy a Hulk 181. You know, I wouldn't necessarily buy a book like that, but an ASM one, an AF 15. Yeah. You know, even right now, like could it go lower maybe, but those types of books, I, I still am open to, to getting. Uh, financially, it'll never reach its peak unless China decides to open back up into the world. Yeah, probably not. But it's kind of like, um, does it have to? Does it have to be a billion dollar franchise? Now, if they're spending the type of money that they are doing on an Avengers movie, that has to make a billion dollars. But X-Men 97, Werewolf by Night, you know, some of these other films, like they spend way too much money on Ant-Man. You know, a movie like Ant-Man should be a hundred million and it should be kind of like lower stakes and, and they should play in that space. 
So those, those are always going to be tough numbers to top for them. Circumstances, what's going on, man? Buy the dip. Buy the dip. Uh, if you guys don't know, Circumstances got his YouTube channel. Always great to watch. Always fun doing his shows. Go check him out. Give him a sub. Great dude in the community. Um, you were the only person I trust in my comic books in consignment. But I don't consign stuff. What do you mean? Uh, the best MCU release in years, having its showrunner fired already is somehow the most MCU thing ever. Yeah, maybe they secretly bring him back as a consultant. Yeah, that, you know, that's a super interesting element to this, which obviously we don't know what happened. There's a lot of talk about why he got fired and stuff. But yeah, he um, he did an amazing job, you know, so far. And he actually had that, that uh, tweet, which uh, shout out to MK in the chat, who... I, I later MK looked up the tweet that I think that you were probably were telling me about where he talked about how it's like, Oh, he wanted this to be like the first part of the series was like a bit, or was like kind of fun and nostalgia and whatever. And then there's going to be a big moment and then we're going to get, get going to get the aftermath. And now we're kind of in that aftermath. And I think he really nailed it with that. Um, I wasn't aware one could stop buying. <laughs> Is that something you could do? No, you can't do it. You're in it forever. It is, Guys, we're stuck. We're on this treadmill. I keep thinking like, you know, I'm not going to go to the comic store this week. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And then I do. And then I buy. And I'm like, why did I buy this? Because it's fun. It's so fun to buy, guys. It's so fun. Uh, honestly asking, do you consider your silver books as investments or high-end luxury items? Um, I don't really consider them investments per se because, okay, yes and no, right? This is, this is going to be a kind of a cop-out answer for me. I like the idea that if I buy a key book and I spend a decent amount of money on it, that I can get my money back at some point when I sell it. And if I buy smart and I buy a discount and I find good deals and maybe I find it in the wild and I grade it myself, I can actually even make money, you know? And, and that's what I tend to try to do is, is as far as like when I buy, I tend to try to buy books that I find good deals on rather than paying fair market value. Is that an investment? Do I think of it as investment? In a way I do in so much as again, I can get my money back out or I can make a little money on top of it. But do I think that that is the best investment use of my investment money? No, I don't. I think that there's better things that I can be buying. This is just way more fun to buy than stocks, right? You know, this is just so much more fun. Um, so that's kind of my answer to that. They can be a good way to do income if you buy well. Some people make a lot of cash. That's for sure. Um, let's see here. Uh, did you sell Luke Cage one, the one that came back with the stellar CGC grade? Mika, I did sell the Luke Cage one. I had people slide into my DMs. They slid in there. And so I had to sell it. You know, I had to. I had to do it. The offer was there. Um, all right, guys. Well, it's been a good show so far. We got about 90 minutes. Uh, this was fun. You know, this was fun to talk about X-Men 97. Let's check back in here, guys. On my Kickstarter, we are at $22,096 with 198 backers. We are so close to hitting 200 backers. Thank you to everyone who already supported, who's in the chat. You know, um, it's been awesome. If you guys don't know, again, I wrote comic series here. It's a noir detective, Lovecraftian thing. Cosmic horror. I love cosmic horror, the fear of the unknown, juxtaposed with the detective who's all about truth that must know, you know, so there's always a fertile ground ground for storytelling there. Um, so anyways, if uh, links in the description, if you guys want to check it out, uh, three days left on the campaign you can get all sorts of different things here, like uh, different variant covers. There's some uh, interior artwork here. You can get some original art pages that I have for sale. Um, you can get uh, oil painting that I showed you guys different tiers here, all kinds of stuff. So if you want to check it out, you want to support me, three days left on the Kickstarter. 
And uh, I would appreciate your support, you know, on this. Uh, anyone snagged that 3K painting yet? Good question. Circumstances. No one has snagged it yet. You know, I priced it a little, priced it a little bit, you know, competitive, uh, not competitive, I should say. Priced it um, a little higher because um, I wouldn't hate keeping it right here. Uh, I showed this earlier in the stream. I actually got the uh, actual oil canvas from my artist trail threat. He sent it to me a few days ago and, uh, you know, the painting had to dry, so he couldn't actually uh, send it to me yet. And I have it. And I ha actually have the original oil painting for sale, guys. Um, you know, it's one of those things where, yes, it would be nice to keep it, but if it does sell, uh, the money will go to good use. Paying my my team, paying my artist, paying my colorist, and uh, being able to kind of continue the series, you know, because really at the end of the day, would it be nice to make money creating comic books? Yeah, absolutely. But you know, it'd be even better than that or a more attainable first goal for me would be to uh, not lose money and also pay the people who are helping me realize it and uh, everyone get a good product out of it. That's really the the goal. So there you have it. Um, would look nice in a frame on the wall for sure. Oh yeah, yeah. hundred percent. I'm definitely going to be framing this. Um, uh, yeah. If it doesn't sell, I'm I talked to earlier. I'm like, he's somewhere in here. I'm going to figure out a space. It's kind of a big, it's kind of a big piece because it's like, I imagine the frame will be even like bigger. So we'll have to see where it'll go. But um, yeah, it was, it was cool to do the key art and um, get something like that commissioned. Uh, I worked, I, I shouldn't say that I work with Jarrell, but Jarrell is a big Magic the Gathering artist. Does a lot of Magic the Gathering um, cards and stuff like that. So I love his oil painting style. He's a big Frank Frazetta fan. And um, I write for Magic the Gathering a decent amount. So we've worked on similar sets and stuff together, but uh, have some mutual friends. So getting him to do a, a commission piece for, for my comic was awesome. It was really cool to get to work with him on that. All right, guys. That's all I got for the stream tonight. X-Men 97, moving the market. A lot of stuff going on with X-Men 97. Um, it's cool to see, you know, uh, people get excited about comic books, you know? kind of speculating on comic books once again in the fun way to speculate on comic books because we're excited to see where the story is going to go. We're excited to own the book. And it's fun to see the thing that I have is the thing that I'm watching and the thing that makes me happy because I have the thing that I'm watching. And so, yeah, Bastion book, guys, Uncanny X-Men 133. Don't FOMO it. Go find it in the wild. But that's going to be the book next week. It's going to be the book already. Everyone's going to lose their mind on it. It's going to be all about Bastion. And uh, one day when PSA has integration into um, eBay, everyone's just going to be able to Wally flip their books to the promised land. And we can all buy our islands that we've been wanting to buy ever since we started collecting Darkhawk number one. All right, guys, that's all I got for the stream tonight. Thanks so much for hanging out. Thanks so much for watching. Hope you guys have a wonderful Sunday evening, and I will see you all in the next stream. And I will finish out. I play my trailer. Peace out, guys. They say if you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares back at you. Well, I've been looking for a long time, and I feel its eyes all around me. We live in strange times. Fact has been blurred with fiction. And in this city of madness, seeing doesn't always mean believing. It means questioning. I like it that way. Questioning people's intentions. Questioning one's surroundings. And sometimes, questioning your own sanity. Let the abyss step back at me. I want it that way. I need to be seen. Because truth isn't something you find, it's something that finds you.